Okay, good afternoon. Welcome back to Senate Education. It's Wednesday, May 5th, uh, 3.32 in the afternoon. We are now shifting uh, our attention to H183, uh, an act relating to sexual violence. Uh, as senators may recall, Senate Judiciary asked that we look at um, a section, I believe it's section 10 of this, or it doesn't matter, uh, a section of this bill having to do with uh, a, a sexual violence prevention council. And so we've asked the drafter, uh, Ms. Childs, to come in and kick this off. Ms. Childs, how are you? I'm great, thanks for having uh, me in. So uh, a committee I don't visit very often. <laughs> well, uh, we have two uh, senators here that you probably don't know, Senators Terenzini and Senator Chittenden. Uh, I suspect oh. perhaps you cross paths with the rest of us, but two uh, new additions. And it's it's great to have you here with us. And so Thank you. you know that uh, Senator Sears reached out to us and uh, initially they, they were thinking they might pull this section. He asked our committee to look at it and see if it makes sense to uh, reintroduce this section. So any background you might give us would be great as well as taking us uh, through it. And I believe uh, Jeannie, uh, has posted it for senators to... I think she has. Okay, and, so. and are you a committee that likes the attorneys to share the screen so you can see the language or do you prefer to look at it separately? We actually have it right on our iPad so uh, it works best for us, thank you. Okay, great. Um, so as you mentioned, uh, this uh, was, there's language with establishing an intercollegiate sexual violence prevention uh, council. And, uh, and it was in the bill as passed by the House and Senate Judiciary removed that section and a couple of related sections that had a, a seven year sunset out and a small appropriation for staffing that council and they removed that. So the bill that they voted out um, on Friday that is now in Senate appropriations um, does not have the intercollegiate council in it. Um, but I did walk through the bill yesterday with Senate appropriations and they're gonna hold it waiting for you to give your recommendation to judiciary and judiciary to speak with appropriations because of that small appropriation in there. And then they would want to weigh in on that with the addition, if there's an addition of the council. Um, so uh, so this, these sections relate to um, a prior uh, task force, which was the, and I'm going to pull it up on my screen just so I don't forget the, the correct name, it was the Vermont Campus Sexual Harm Task Force. And uh, that task force was created in 2019 by the legislature and uh, passed in Act 77, uh, which was our miscellaneous judiciary procedures bill. And it created this task force on uh, campus sexual harm to examine issues relating to responses to sexual harm, dating and intimate partner violence and stalking on campuses of post-secondary educational institutions in Vermont. And then it required that task force to report to the General Assembly uh, in spring of last year, which they did. Uh, and the very first recommendation of the task force was uh, to create a statewide council of network professionals who are focused on both prevention and response to sexual harm on college campuses. Uh, and as well to focus on how to best support uh, both survivors and other students who have been impacted by sexual harm. And so what you have in H-183 as it came over from the House was establishing uh, this, uh, this council. And again, the idea that it wasn't like the task force to be a, a short, essentially study committee, but something that would be permanent um, uh, going forward. There is uh, a seven year sunset on that because um, it was uh, reviewed by House Government Operations and they put in a seven year sunset really on any new uh, governmental bodies like that, that or, or councils or boards or things like that so that the, you know we don't have these ones that kind of start and then kind of fall to the wayside and are still on the books. And so there's a, kind of a fresh look at least every seven years. Um, and there was also a, uh, a, an appropriation, a small appropriation in the proposal for funding uh, the staffing of 
the council. Um, it, there are no legislative members on this council as opposed to the task force did have a couple legislative members. Um, I'll walk through the legislation in just a moment with you about it, but the appropriation um, is to allow the Network Against Domestic and Sexual Violence to be doing the staffing of the four annual meetings a year. Um, so if I uh, look to the language of the bill, if everybody has that, um, is you'll see that, uh, so it's establishing a new section 2187 in Title 16, uh, creating the council for the purpose of a response to campus sexual harm, including across institutions of higher learning in Vermont. Um, there are a large number of folks on the council. Um, it's first, it's a Title IX coordinator and a campus-based prevention educator coordinator from an institution of higher learning appointed by the chancellor of the Vermont State Colleges. There are similarly to those same two positions to be also um, appointed by the president of the University of Vermont. And then similarly, those same two positions uh, appointed by the president of the Association of Vermont Independent Colleges. So there'll be three Title IX coordinators and three campus-based prevention education coordinators um, appointed there. Um, there's also uh, to be two community-based sexual violence advocates appointed by the network, two law enforcement or public safety representatives who have experience specific to responding and investigating campus sexual violence. And those members would be appointed by the commissioner of public safety. Uh, there's to be two college students, at least one of whom has lived experience um, as a sexual violence survivor and one who represents a campus-based racial justice organization. And those two student appointments would be, um, would be by the Center for Crime Victim Services. There's also a person with expertise in sexual violence responses within the LGBTQ community. And that appointment would be made by the, um, by the Center for Crime Victim Services as well. There's to be a sexual assault nurse examiner who is appointed by the Network Against Domestic and Sexual Violence. These are, uh, are nurses who are trained specifically to work with survivors of sexual violence, to, um, uh, to be there when somebody reports to an ER um, that they have been sexually assaulted and they um, have specific training in that around the emotional needs, but also um, how to do the examination of that survivor, because as you can imagine, um, when they do that, they're actually collecting evidence that is important if there's going to be uh, criminal charges. And so it's very important that that evidence be collected um, uh, in, in a certain way and that there's a chain of custody with regard to that evidence. Um, there's also to be a prosecutor who has experience prosecuting sexual violence cases, and that prosecutor could be from either um, one of the state's attorney's offices, or it could be from the office of the attorney general, and that, that appointment is made by the AG. Um, there's to be an attorney with experience in sexual violence that's appointed by the defender general. And so those are the folks who are all on uh, the, the council. Um, the duties uh, of the council um, are interdisciplinary planning and information sharing to support sexual violence prevention programs on every college campus in Vermont. There's to be an annual review of trends and aggregate data collected by institutions of higher learning regarding sexual violence on campus and development and distribution of best practices and recommendations on violence prevention, sexual health education and strategies for mitigating sexual violence and tertiary violence on co college campuses. As I mentioned, the network's gonna be doing the, the staffing of this. That was just, um, they volunteered because there wasn't kind of an obvious entity uh, to staff it, and so the the network seemed the, the because of their background and experience in this particular issue seemed the best choice. Um, there is a report that is due on or before December of 2022, and then annually thereafter, um, and there to uh, submit a written report to the General Assembly with a summary of their activities and any recommendations for legislative uh, action. Um, they're supposed to have their first meeting no later than September 15th of this year. 
And um, there is, as I mentioned, a small appropriation. I think when we were looking at those members in House appropriations, it, it is likely that the vast majority of those people who would be participating on council would be being paid by their day jobs to be attending those meetings four times a year. And that it's likely that it's really only the two student representatives who would be putting in for the per diems and expenses. And so that's how it was calculated out for those. Um, so the section uh, on appropriations has $11,990 being appropriated to the center um, to provide uh, to provide a grant for staffing the council. And that's just how we had to do it because the network is not a state entity where this, as the center is a state entity. And so you're appropriating the money to the center and then they will issue a grant to the network to do the staffing. And then the, and then there's a separate $1,000 and 10, $1,010 that's us, that's appropriated for the per diems and expenses. And then also, as I mentioned, there's the repeal in seven years, which is just intended as a kind of a, um, a regular kind of taking a look to make sure that you want to continue on with the council. And that's all. That's all I've got. Any questions? Maybe questions or comments at this point. We do have a series of witnesses, but uh, this is very helpful. Senator Perslick. Just a quick question on the appropriations. Is it something that would have to be done every year? Because this is only a one-year appropriation, but it will be around for seven years. So it's just a, every year the legislature would have to address that issue? Likely, unless there was a grant or they could uh, use some federal funds for it or something like that. But it's likely that it would be an annual appropriation. And this one is just for FY22. OK. I have another, I have another question, but if you'd rather please. do that, wait. No, please, go ahead. This was all in House Judiciary Committee, right? Uh, yes, it was. The bill was in House Judiciary um, with uh, government operations, took this and specifically reviewed this section, and they took testimony on it, and they made recommendations to Judiciary, and Judiciary incorporated those suggestions into the Judiciary Amendment. And then on the Senate side, it, was, it came out of Senate Judiciary. And do you know... Michelle, that because I read the task force report last night, and there's like 15 recommendations or more in there. If you take some of the recommend, there's only like nine main ones. Some of them have sub recommendations. Did they like go through all those recommendations and then choose these kind of three tasks for this? Because I thought there were some other really important recommendations in that report, but aren't mentioned at all in this. I don't know if they like kind of went through all those and decided well. You can just focus on these three for this for now, or I just wondered if you could tell me anything about the process in relation to the recommendations from the task force report. Um, to the judiciary committees did not go into the task force report in depth. Um, the establishment of the council was part of the bill as introduced. I believe the three main sponsors were Representative Copenhagen's, uh, Representative Grad, and Representative Colburn. Um, and, uh, and they had been meeting with folks prior to the start of the session on developing this bill. And I think getting input from the community around um, what, what are the important things if they were gonna proceed on, a, on a, a sexual violence bill, what are the key issues out there that would be helpful? And I think the recommendation was to establish the council but there was, they weren't hearing necessarily, we want you to do X, Y, or Z also this year with regard to this specific issue. I think the primary goal was that they wanted to make sure that all the folks who are working on these issues are getting together at least a few times a year and collaborating and sharing their experiences so that they can learn from one another's uh, work. Right, and as you said, the first recommendation was create a council and Representative Coburn was on the task force. So it, it's good to hear that she was involved in this. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Senator Lyons. You know, I think I'll wait until we've had testimony. I've got a long list of things here. Okay. So I think it'd be helpful to hear what folks have to say. Um, but maybe Michelle 
in terms of any definition of sexual violence, was that was that a discussion? Okay. No, I think um, you know they didn't want to be too prescriptive around that, and it can encompass a lot of you know things. And so, um, so I think they're just leaving that up to the council. Okay. So. Mm -hmm. there would be a distinction between sexual harassment and sexual violence or would they with the council was there a discussion about allowing for the council to go into uh the issues mm -hmm. of sexual harassment i mean that expands it greatly and moves it toward perhaps staff and faculty in a way that may be slightly different i don't know you know, they did not really discuss that, but I'll go back and look at the language. I don't know necessarily that it was intended to be narrow in terms of violence, but looking, you know, I, I recognize that the, the language that was used for the task force was sexual harm. Um, and you could, you know, tweak the language a little bit there if you wanted it to be a little more inclusive. Mm -hmm. What I will say, and I think is something that you guys know from sitting on committees and, you know, summer study committees and creating these summer study committees, there's no, there's nobody really policing, um, you know, well, you guys reported to us on this and we didn't ask you to report to us on that or, you know, things like that. So I think generally it's to try to get the, you know, the specifics out there about you know, what you want, um, you know, but on this issue, if you want, if you want it to include a variety of, of issues, you know, maybe you would want to tweak the, the language and, and, you know, obviously the Title IX coordinators are not just looking at sexual violence, they're looking at discrimination based on sex and they're looking at harassment and other other issues there so so maybe that's appropriate and maybe um some of the witnesses from the schools might comment on that about whether or not there should be a, a different term used thank you yes i know because it can grow like gangbusters really but, um, right yeah maybe yeah maybe it should be narrow because then i don't know i i want I, I, I want to hear what everyone has to say so but thank you Sure. Michelle, you may have already covered this, uh, and I apologize if I missed it, but can you speak a little bit to why, again, Senate Judiciary decided to remove this? You might not feel comfortable doing so, but it just having uh, been part of the conversations. Uh, yeah, I don't want to obviously speak for anyone. Yeah, it, I understand. Um, uh, so, uh, Senator Baruth was the Senate appointee to the task force, and his viewpoint in uh, in Senate Judiciary was that the um, if the if the folks who are designated on the for to be on the council wanted to get together and do something like this anyway, they could do that on their own, and they wouldn't need the General Assembly necessarily to establish this council to uh to to do that um but uh, you know i i would say you might want to speak directly with him or other other members um okay of that i don't want to i don't, I don't want to get their purpose yeah, I understand. out incorrect okay. uh, uh any other questions for uh miss child before we start to hear from our witnesses Thanks a million, Michelle, for walking us through this. Uh, you know, I, I have a feeling since we've been um, asked to take this up, you know, we'll continue to have you in committee a little bit. I, I know your schedule is is also um, tight. And so uh, as much time as you, you can uh, give us will be much appreciated. But uh, for now, that was a great walkthrough and very helpful. Sure, thanks. So I am probably gonna bounce back and forth between with another committee, but if, yeah, yeah. Um, if I do leave and you guys have some questions for me or something I can circle back around, uh, let me know and just have Jeannie email me. And um, in, in general, I think the question would be uh, if we have uh, su language suggestions, changes that we make, uh, is this something that you'll go back and, and listen, or do you want us to take notes and then provide you with that? Those well, that's what I'm saying is if you have, if you decide some tweaks that you'd like to make, okay. I'll back in and, and then sit with you and we'll, we'll chat. Right. And okay, that sounds great. You can just tell me that way I can ask you questions to make it really clear that I know direction. And I do know that 
Um, Ms. Koning has su submitted some, uh, like a tweak there, and I do have that language. It's, I okay. did in what I presented to you because it hasn't been adopted by anybody, but I do have that language because I know that y'all will discuss that. Yeah, great, thank you. Sure. Uh, Ms. Koenig, you're not up yet, but have you uh, emailed that language to Jeannie? No, I sent a copy of it to you, but I'm happy to send it to Jeannie. You send it to Jeannie and then yep. uh, Jeannie, uh, would you please put it up on our website? That'd be great. Thank Certainly. you. Okay, um, Ms. Robinson. Thanks for joining us. Appreciate you being here. Uh, you've been involved, I believe, with this bill all the way through it, the process. So uh, uh, looking forward to hearing what you have to say as it relates to this language. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, for the record, Sarah Robinson. I'm the Deputy Director at the Vermont Network Against Domestic and Sexual Violence. I don't believe I've had the pleasure to be with this committee yet uh, this session, so it's wonderful to, uh, to be with you all. And thank you so much for taking up this section of H-183. You're correct. This is, um, it really is a broad and comprehensive bill uh, to address sexual violence in our communities and on campus and in various settings. And so we're very grateful that the Senate Education Committee is looking at this particular section. But I thought I would start by just uh, providing a short amount of framing around the issue that this section of the bill and the bill in general seeks to address, um, knowing that um, it's not, not the complete focus of, of your work probably in the, in the day to day. So from our perspective, um, you know, the Vermont Network is really serves as a statewide voice on issues related to domestic and sexual violence. And we are a membership organization. We represent 15 independent nonprofit organizations that provide direct services to victims of domestic and sexual violence across the state. Um, and together, those organizations serve every square mile of Vermont. And last year, they answered about 17,000 hotline calls from individuals calling for assistance uh, related to domestic and sexual violence. Would you, so we, would you repeat that number, please? Sure. Uh, our member organizations answered 17,000 hotline calls last year in the state of Vermont, yeah, um, for people uh, seeking assistance related to domestic and sexual violence. And we know that sexual violence is in fact a significant issue, certainly in our country and here in Vermont. So nationally, um, approximately one in five women have experienced rape in their lifetime, and one in three women um, have experienced other forms of sexual violence, such as sexual coercion or unwanted sexual contact. Um, and although national prevalence studies certainly indicate that women carry the greatest burden of sexual violence over their lifetimes, men are very much also impacted by sexual violence. And as with other forms of violence, uh, some communities are disproportionately impacted by sexual violence. And that includes uh, black, indigenous, and other people of color, and transgender and non-gender conforming individuals. And here in Vermont, unfortunately, we are not exempt from those trends and the overall impact of sexual violence. So I thought it would be interesting for this committee um, to know that the most recent Vermont Youth Risk Behavior Survey um, indicated that one in 10 female students in Vermont uh, report being physically forced to have intercourse when they did not want to. And students of color in Vermont are more likely than white students to have been forced to have sexual intercourse. Uh, likewise, LGBTQ students are more than three times as likely to be forced to have sexual intercourse compared to their um, heterosexual or cisgender peers. So um, the section of the bill that you are addressing today really seeks to look at uh, campus responses to sexual violence. And we certainly, um, at least this week, don't need to go much further than um, news outlets to understand that this is not um, an isolated issue, that this is an issue that is very important to um, students and institutions of higher learning across Vermont. Um, and as you've noted, this was really the primary recommendation of the previous 
legislative task force on campus sexual harm. Um, I Sounds like some of you have seen the report um, from that previous task force, but I did also submit that to Jeannie, so I know it is posted on the website. Um, but the council will really serve to coordinate and innovate responses to sexual violence on college campuses across Vermont. Um, and we know that nationally, one in five students and just over one in five transgender students are sexually assaulted on college campuses. And that uh, age period, like age period between 18 and 24, um, is the uh, the age period of higher highest risk for for women um, in terms of being sexually assaulted. So they're four times more likely to be sexually assaulted between the ages of 18 and 24 than they are at other times in their in their lifetime. And sexual violence within institutions of higher learning is complex. You know, there are issues of both state and federal law. There's overlapping criminal jurisdictions sometimes. There are very important issues related to student privacy and certainly the extrajudicial Title IX proceedings um, are a, a completely different layer that victims of domestic, uh, victims of sexual violence have to navigate if they choose to report their assault. And really despite many efforts of institutions, um, the process of reporting a sexual assault and making a formal Title IX complaint often doesn't go well for survivors. Um, Many don't feel like they receive the support and justice that they're seeking through that process. There was a recent report that was released actually just about a month ago from a national organization called Know Your Nine, um, referring to Title IX. And it, it found that 39% of survivors who reported sexual violence um, to their schools experienced a, a substantial disruption in their education. So, over a quarter of those survivors ended up taking a leave of absence, 20% transferred schools, um, and nearly 10% dropped out of their educational experience completely. And so campuses really have varying resources and approaches to addressing um, sexual violence. And that's one of the things that we were really hopeful that this council would be able to address both the support services and the resources that are available for students at um, public and private uh, colleges and universities, at small and large colleges and universities, at residential versus commuter schools really vary um, based on the institutional resources that are available and those that are dedicated to these efforts. And I would just note that, you know, we certainly don't view that these problems can be solved by institutions of higher learning alone. Um, they really require an interdisciplinary approach with stakeholders from law enforcement, from advocacy um, at the table. And those are the kinds of complex issues that uh, the council would seek to address. Um, I would just make a note on the uh, length of the council that was established by the House. As the bill was introduced, there actually wasn't uh, a sunset, and that was something that the House um, added, which I think was uh, an excellent addition. Um, and I would just note that the previous task force on campus sexual harm in 2019 um, only existed for about nine months um, and met six times in that nine months. And I think one of the big lessons learned was that the reforms that are needed, the institutional and community-based reforms that are needed um, take time. And that ensuring that there's adequate time and resources to addressing this particular issue um, ought to be a priority for um, certainly all of us that work on these issues day to day and that this was going to be an effective mechanism for getting there. Um, and with that, I'm happy to take any questions on the composition um, or uh, the duties of the council or anything else. Uh, Ms. Robinson, if I may uh, just kick this off. So uh, you, you're supporting this language as written. So we um, supported the conversations uh, as those evolved in the House. Um, we were very much expecting that the Senate would take its own fresh look at the language. Um, you know, we didn't have an opportunity to have robust conversations about that in 
Senate Judiciary. So we supported the language that came out of the House, but very open to additional suggestions that senators may have about ways to improve the language. So again, just to clarify, the language that we have before us, which left the House, you are you are supportive of? Correct. Okay, thank you. Senator Lyons. Just a couple of questions. Uh, you obviously mentioned support services that are so critical for people in recovery, uh, but did is is there also opportunity here to talk about um, some uh, primary uh, prevention? some work that's done. And I think, I think in particular about students who coalesce uh, within a, a group environment with a, a support person to, to educate their peers and others about uh, what sexual violence is and to initiate prevention activities. And so much of that, what we're seeing here is uh, how to react to sexual violence when it happens. And we're trying to, you know, obviously, we need to do that, but um, is, shouldn't we also, or would you think we'd like to have some other focused uh, attention to prevention, period? Senator Lyons, I think that's an excellent question. And I think that's exactly um, a bit of a shift that we were hoping to see in this council. The previous um, task force really did look um, almost exclusively at responses, which I think is incredibly important. But the hope was certainly that with this council, there would be a closer look at primary prevention efforts and efforts to change overall campus climate um, and to prevent the violence before it happens. And I think that that was the intention of the first duty uh, listed of the council um, interdisciplinary planning and information sharing to support sexual violence prevention programs on every college campus in Vermont. So that, I mean, that works. The, there is a significant emphasis in the membership. I, it feels like a, a significant emphasis on um, enforcement uh, rather than prevention. So or it's more on intervention and reporting. And um, so I'm, I'm very interested in how to turn that corner. So it, it is really looking at best practices for prevention, uh, what kind of training activities on campus, ongoing for staff, faculty, students, and maybe in particular, the cohorts of students that are ordinarily uh, associated with sexual violence. Uh, so we already know a lot. Uh, it, so maybe there's a way to approach this from the prevention side rather than the intervention and treatment side. Yes, I, I appreciate that. And I would just note that actually the bill is introduced didn't really have any representation from at least the, the um, criminal legal perspective. And those were additions that were requested by um, the Association of States Attorneys and the Defender General to add those individuals to the council. Um, and we were fine with that. We know that some survivors do seek um, legal remedies, uh, criminal legal remedies as a result of their experience. But I completely agree with you that our hope is certainly that the um, council as a whole will be taking a look at primary prevention um, not just responses to violence after it occurs. So then to that end, going back to something Senator Perchlick asked earlier, why not pick up the recommendations made by the previous task force that do look, uh, do suggest best practice and other areas um, related to prevention. So I won't ask any more questions. I, I just wrote down a whole lot of things. We'll have to, maybe the people who want to talk about, maybe not, but. Anyway, just Thank some you. ideas. Sort of just picking up on that idea, uh, you know, what, what are we doing or what are we not doing also in pre-K through 12th grade? I mean, we're talking about here, I think largely campus culture, but that campus culture is, uh, is not just being created out of thin air. Uh, and so I think that would be the, my other question and something that hopefully we can, we can also work toward addressing. 
would love to have that conversation um, with the committee at some point. I know that the last time the legislature really looked very comprehensively at sexual violence prevention was after um, Brooke Bennett died in Vermont several years back and Act One was passed around uh, mandating sexual violence prevention in schools. And that remains a largely actually completely unfunded um, mandate to provide sexual violence prevention. So I think that that would be a really worthy conversation. Senator Persley. Thank you, Chair. Um, to Senator Lyon's point that the title is Violence Prevention Council, but in the first sentence of the creation, it says create a coordinated response, like that the, we're creating a council to create a coordinated response. So just maybe it's semantics, but adding uh, prevention in, in that first thing, because of the three goals, it does say prevention in that first goal, but you might want to, we might want to think about just adding prevention in there. But my question, when I went through all these recommendations that I thought were, were good, one that I think specifically you might be able to answer is one of the comments in the in the recommendation to create a council it said the task force agrees that a council would be best facilitated by on-campus stakeholders and it looks like this is is not facilitated by on-campus stakeholders and i just i'm assuming that was a conscious decision or it was i think as michelle said uh, the network was just like well if nobody else is going to do it we're, we're going to do it do you have sure, any response to that? Yeah, I'm happy to speak to that. So the um, previous task force in discussing this recommendation, there was a conversation of the task force about who, sh where this task force should essentially live and whether it should be a state agency, whether it should be higher education stakeholders that would kind of house this. Um, and there, there weren't volunteers. Um, and the network said, we're willing to do it, but we would also be very happy to step back if there was um, a different entity that would like to step forward. Um, our sincere hope, and you'll see that in um, the language indicates uh, chairs will be elected or decided on um, from the membership. And it is our sincere hope that there would be leadership of this council that would be on campus leadership. Um, we certainly believe that institutions of higher education um, need to have a leadership role in this conversation. Um, and so if that would be worth, um, you know, clarifying in the language, I think that would definitely be something we would be open to. And again, um, we are, are truly, we're trying, trying to be helpful and also happy to step back if there's another volunteer that would like to take on the coordination of this council. Okay, I appreciate that. Um, I have a couple more questions, Please. if that's okay. Um, the, the second duty is to review the, in the aggregated data. When I looked at the recommendations, there was like three big recommendations about data, about data gathering, and that we should require institutions to, to collect this data and about a, um, a survey that should go out and that they should be kind of disaggregating the data to those historically disadvantaged groups. You had given some statistics for LGBTQ uh, victims, but I didn't know if, how we were. It seemed like that was a big part of the, the task force recommendations. And do we need to put anything in there about that we're getting the data that we need? Is, is that problem been solved? It's a great question. And I would also say that the version um, that passed the House was not the version of the bill that was introduced, there was actually more specific language around campus climate surveys and data in the original language of the bill. And there was feedback from higher education stakeholders that, um, and I, I don't want to speak for them, but um, hopefully uh, Wendy may be able to speak to this, that they uh, did not necessarily want to be boxed into collecting data in the same way or collecting the same kind of data every year. And that they already had individual mechanisms for collecting data. So we landed on this language around um, annual review of trends and aggregate data um, because institutions are already collecting some climate data in their own ways. But I, I can let those uh, witnesses speak to that. Okay, well, it's something maybe for the committee to think about because we're requiring a lot of data collection like on our end. 
expulsion bill about all the data that needed to be collected and have it, you know, break down by by the disadvantaged groups and everything. So we're requiring that of our K through 12. So um, be interesting why we wouldn't require it of our higher education. There's two other recommendations I wondered if you could just quickly talk about. One was, and I thought it was pertinent to the Senate because we just passed the bill that would ex um, not exempt, but make people not subject to criminal prosecution if they report a crime. I think it was around specifically around trying to help people with drug overdoses and things like that. But one of the recommendations was don't prosecute students who report uh, a sexual assault if they were like underage drinking or if, if they were in violation of the campus policy and they were afraid to come forward. That rec was recommended and there's an anything about this. And then also about requiring transcript notation of suspensions and expulsions resulting from Title IX adjudication. That also seemed like a real big one that I didn't see mentioned. So those, I wondered if you could just say anything about those two recommendations. Sure, absolutely. Um, so taking the second one first on transcript notation, I think that um, actually probably both of those uh, are the original thinking was that that would kind of fit in the larger bucket of duty number three, which is development and distribution of best practices and recommendations. Um, and that certainly we would absolutely um, concur that reducing all the barriers for individuals to be able to report harm that they experience coming forward without fear of um, you know, their own disciplinary actions is incredibly important. Um, and I would say that that is certainly a best practice that um, is not, as you're, you um, rightly noted, is being advanced not only in the criminal legal system, but on campuses um, across, across the country. And on the transcript notation um, issue, you know, that was not, it was not a unanimous recommendation of the previous task force. It was, um, there was not a unanimous agreement about that. So it wasn't presented as one of the unanimous items. That being said, I think that is an issue that um, is worthy of continual conversation in Vermont. It's a complex issue. Um, there are a lot of individuals that feel very passionately and strongly that that is an, a very effective mechanism um, to providing information about individuals who have um, caused harm on previous campuses. And I will also say from our perspective, you know, we have historically been a um, little bit wary of anything that can function like a registry, just because we think that they can sometimes create a false sense of security um, and um, don't exactly serve to create real safety or um, provide supports to survivors, which is really where our focus is. Um, and so I think that, again, that's a complex issue that hopefully this council will be able to continue discussing. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions from Ms. Robinson? We're gonna be at this probably uh, for, you know, uh, couple of days, if you will. Uh, so if you don't mind continuing to partner with, with us, I don't know if you have additional comments at this point. At this point, I don't. I'm just be interested to hear other witnesses and certainly open to any suggestions of the committee and happy to work with you all um, in the coming days. Thank you very much. We really appreciate that. And yes, please, uh, please stay. And um, we'll, uh, we may re-engage you before we, we adjourn today. Thank you. Ms. Koenig. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, Great to see you. See you. For the record, I'm Wendy Koenig, Director of Federal and State Relations for the University of Vermont. And Wendy, just um, so you, I, do you have a bad connection? You're, you're, maybe it's my connection. Are, are you okay at your end? Um, yeah, I can you, see you and okay, hear you okay. Right. Okay, you were just a little pause there. Uh, so that's... That's good to know. Okay, the floor is yours. Thanks. Um, so uh, I did send um, some language to Jeannie. I don't know if you all have it, but if not, you can take a look. I'll, I'll read a little bit of it. Um, you know, I want to say that um, I think that from the perspective of higher education, 
practices in prevention of sexual violence and harm are evolving all the time. Um, I think that uh, a council could be helpful to inform new strategies and help uh, frame prevention in a variety of different ways. And I really liked what Sarah had to say um, about the fact that, um, you know, this is, is something that we can work together on to, um, to try and uh, make this the safest place that we can for students and, and to um, continually evolve our thinking about these issues. I mean, I don't think that this is static. I think it's something that we're always working on and, and other campuses are working on. Um, you know, I, I think that in terms of the makeup of the council, um, you know, we have Title IX coordinators named in the 2019 um, council, we did have our Title IX coordinator participating. Um, I think that that's appropriate. Um, I know that, that for the state colleges and for us, they're asking for two folks, a Title IX coordinator and a campus-based uh, coordinator. So I think that we just wanna ensure that we have a little bit of flexibility. Um, I think UVM is a little bit different in the fact that we are big, we probably have more staff than other institutions. I think sometimes it is hard when you're conducting um, adjudications on campus to have two people from your Title IX staff be at meetings every time, um, but we'll, we'll do our best with that. Um, in terms of, of the language that I'm talking about, if you're looking at the bill, um, it's in section C, the duties section. Um, and the language now says development and distribution of best practices and recommendations on violence prevention, sexual health education, and strategies for mitigating sexual violence and tertiary violence on college campuses in Vermont. Um, what we are suggesting is to say, identification and sharing of effective practices on violence prevention, sexual education, um, sexual health education and strategies for mitigating sexual violence and tertiary violence. So we're taking out the term best practices and asking for identification and sharing of effective practices. Our legal counsel um, had a little bit of a problem with the term best practices and, and would prefer the other language. I don't think it really changes um, anything substantively. It's just a little bit of a language tweak um, for us. Happy to, yeah, take uh, any questions. Uh, Senator Chittenden. So Wendy, I also see the, the replacement of the word development with identification. I'm guessing that's because we, we don't want, are we trying to not necessarily scale this back, but uh, not to reinvent the wheel or is that mm -hmm. important? Well, okay. Yeah, and, and the other thing is, I think one thing that we've sort of had some discussions about when talking about this in the prior council and talking about the development of this one is that we just want to be careful to not um, try to have one size fits all either. I mean, I think that what we need for prevention efforts on UVM's campus might be quite different from what we need for prevention efforts at Sterling College. And so I think we want to be mindful of the fact that we want to share with each other and innovate with one another. And I will be the first person to say that UVM, um, even though we're big, can learn a lot of things from some, some of our smaller counterparts in the private colleges and the state colleges. And we want to be participatory with all of our colleagues and doing those things. But I do want to be careful that the council um, does not try to have a one size fits all solution for every institution. And to be mindful of the fact that when we are developing solutions, we do have to understand that um, a lot of what we are bound by on campuses with this is federal law. And that we, we have to uh, be mindful of that when we're, we're making these um, recommendations. Senator Lyons. So knowing that the university does reproduce culture and send it on, sends it on its way into, the, into society, um, the, the issue I think also is um, learning respect mm -hmm. at, in, in, and non-discrimination within the college community. 
And so with that in mind, um, and I know UVM is confronting this right now. I know that you're, there's a lot going on and you're bringing people together. I, uh, I think that it's good to see the response to the, to the kids, um, frankly. But um, is there any thought, uh, are there currently on UVM's campus, is there currently a prevention council or a, a group of folks who plan and uh, provide educational uh, opportunities for students during orientation or other times of the year for social adjustment and, uh, and prevention, sort of thinking about all of these various issues? Yes, um, that's a very good question. And the answer to that is yes. I think that you may have seen some of um, the materials that went out in conversations with the student this, students this week. Um, we do have a group that meet to talk about education and every student at UVM in their first year is required to take some training in this area. We also have a separate training program um, that targets young men, which is a little bit different than, than the regular training that goes for every student. Um, I think that one of the things that we have talked about with students this week is enhancing those trainings um, and maybe having them go further throughout uh, students' time at UVM. So a, a sexual violence prevention council, we have something that functions in that way. It's not called that right now, um, but we do have training for every student that comes into the university, but we um, absolutely can do better and should do better with that. And um, we'll be enhancing those things as we move forward. And I'm certain that as um, part of this council, we'll have a lot of discussions about um, what other schools are doing about that and how we can do that better, um, what we can learn from other folks and what folks can learn from us. So it's part of identifying most effective practices, I mm -hmm. think. So, uh, and I'm, I'm not sure that this is the council that would do an assessment or an evaluation of what each college is doing, yet I think it will be important for folks who represent institutions to be able to bring information that allows for some judgment on what has happened. I, so, there, sure. there is historical data and, and it can be analyzed to build more effective uh, results. Agreed. And I think Title IX coordinators being named as the representatives are the, the exact right people to do that. They're the folks that are doing this on the ground. Okay. So um, you've answered most of my questions that I had right now. I'll okay. turn it over to somebody else. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Childs, while we have you back, uh, Ms. Uh, Koenig made a, a language change and identified it as really not, uh, not that we're questioning you, Ms. Koenig, uh, but sure. that it wasn't going to, to, to change things dramatically and just want to check in with you as well that this doesn't. Um, if it's the language from earlier and it hasn't changed, no, it's just a, just semantics, and it yeah. I guess it's fine. it's the same as it's the same as before, Michelle. Yeah. Right. Yep. Great. So, committee, I'm I'm uh, looking for a question <laughs> opposition to to that language change at this point. Okay. Great. So we'll make that change if you would be so kind, Ms. Childs. Uh, Thank you, Ms. Koenig. Uh, we'll likely, you know, we're gonna, as I mentioned uh, at the start of this, we're gonna probably take a couple of days on this. So we may uh, invite you back, but really appreciate you being in at this point. Really appreciate you having me. Thank you so much. Great. Uh, Patty Turley, uh, Catherine Lavasser. Ms. Turley, uh, welcome to Senate Education. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, and uh, great to see you, Ms. Lavasser. Uh, Ms. Turley, you're, this being your first time, if you wouldn't mind uh, introducing yourself for the record uh, prior to uh, telling us your thoughts on uh, this uh, piece of the bill. Certainly. I am Patty Turley, and I am the general counsel for the Vermont State Colleges. 
I'm uh, relatively new to this role, so there may be some, some if you have certain questions, I may need to refer back to, uh, um, refer back with answers. And, uh, um, but yes, Vermont State Colleges uh, has, has title, um, we, sorry, let me start again. We have uh, title nine coordinators associated with each one of our campuses as well as Title IX uh, coordinators with CCV, which does not have a, a specific residential campus. Um, your, um, the, the Title IX coordinators serve um, as an immediate source of support to students and they, they provide information and support. Their role is really governed by the, the Title IX law, the federal law. So due to our size, all of our VSC Title IX coordinators also have other responsibilities at their respective institutions. An example of a dual role is a coordinator who also serves at, with ADA, um, disability accommodations for students. So the, our Title IX coordinators are um, quite involved with students in, in student facing positions. And we're very cognizant of the need to preserve their their time to best serve our students. Um, we have uh, one of our, some of our employees have participated. There was the, the prior legislative task force that you've been discussing and one of our uh, employees was involved in that. Um, we've also had an employee involved in a, um, a voluntary, I'm not quite sure it's an intercollegiate sexual violence group that met regularly um, a couple of years ago. And we've heard from those employees that the participation in these groups was quite valuable. Uh, they in turn shared the information on with the employees across our organization. And uh, so that our system did benefit from this, uh, from this participation. So we support the Intercollegiate Sexual Violence Prevention Council. We, um, our full disclosure is that we were a little hesitant um, of an earlier version of the bill. We were a little worried about the size of the council, um, not, the, not so much just the size of the council, but the size of what we might be required to have all of our, our Title IX coordinators attend, which would be pretty, um, would, would be pretty difficult for us. And uh, we also wanted to understand what the time uh, commitments would be in terms of the um, amount of the meetings per year. And the House version um, really addressed those concerns. We feel really good about the, um, the one coordinator and the one um, other educator from, from the Vermont State Colleges. We, uh, so I am not a Title IX coordinator and we did have a Title IX coordinator who um, was testifying, who testified in front of the House Government Operations committee. Um, I, regretfully, I, uh, she would be your, your better, a, a very good witness for you today, but she was not able to be here. Uh, what, what she has provided for me, and I've also pulled our other coordinators, um, is the kinds of resources that they have available to them now um, are, we, we belong to some national groups, and there's some trainings through that that they attend. Uh, we also have um, resources that they tap into from those national groups that are, are just regular materials distributed to them. Our Title IX coordinators are very interactive with each other. They provide peer-to-peer -peer support and consultation with each other. And they do meet together as a group um, on, on occasion or regular occasion. We also have a um, assistant investigator who is the assistant general counsel here in the office and she supports their roles um, as they go forward. Uh, the, but the, our coordinators have made it clear that they really do appreciate the opportunity to network with others, to be part of this, um, this type of collaboration, um, which is really the design of this council. So that is, um, we support the, the makeup of this council and the goals of it. Thank you so much. Uh, very helpful, very much appreciate that. Uh, committee, uh, questions for uh, Ms. Trelley. Uh, Ms. Lavasser, are you, uh, are you here? Uh, did you wanna say anything? I'm here in a support capacity. So if there's a question that's better suited for me, I'm here to answer okay. it. Thank you so much. Senator Lyons. 
So as we're talking about um, sexual violence and prevention of sexual violence, and we know that it's a it's it's easily to slide into so many different areas, including academic discrimination, um, and and so on. So as as you're thinking about this, uh, and as I, as we're as we are all thinking about this. Uh, how can we make this the, the most effective uh, collaboration so that we get results that change campus culture? And so for me, it's all about the campus culture. And if the culture is one that supports violence, it's going to happen regardless of how many educational opportunities and workshops and, or, or small group events take place. And the, so the campus culture for me uh, begins with faculty and staff, as you know. So how can we inculcate in this group the ability to transform? This is a little job, something little, transform culture on our campuses that move us away from uh, sexual violence. And obviously you folks have probably thought about this a lot more than we have. So there, uh, but if your Title IX people have been working together and there's so much going on through orientation and other things that are happening on campus, but we're still seeing the results of a dysfunctional culture. So it doesn't matter how many groups we have, unless we begin to target this shift. So, well, well that's that's an excellent point. This is this is an enormous problem that that um, is reflected in our campuses, but that doesn't originate in our campuses. Exactly. Yeah, and and so we we we're trying to um, we are trying to change the culture we're trying to improve that culture it does start with orientation our student the orientation of our student includes this culture of respect that um, that is the the right the right way forward and for some of them that is a, a new um, you know that's a that's a, a unfortunately a new concept mm -hmm. uh, the other aspect is that it also starts from the top, right? And the culture of respect doesn't just, um, it's not a student problem. It's a, it's a, it's, it's a system wide or society wide issue. And so we do have trainings for employees. We have trainings for students. Um, uh, that, that's the, where we are at this point. I agree that one group or, or even many groups um, is, is, is if it can make a dent, I do think that's helpful because every time we make inroads um, to improve and lessen that, uh, that uh, uh, tendency, then, then we've, uh, we, we have made progress. But I agree with you, it, it, is, uh, it is daunting at times. Yeah, so I mean, so we're focused here on preventing uh, violence and harm, and we're looking at students causing harm to other students through sexual violence. But as, as you have said, it is uh, ubiquitous and it's horizontal as well as longitudinal. So uh, maybe there's something we could add into this, the charge of the committee and I'm gonna have to think about it. I, I share your concern. I share your concern. Yes. Senator Persley. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Turley, would you, would this, the Vermont State Colleges be opposed to language? I don't think we could actually do it at this late of the game, but maybe we would have the council work on a recommended language that would lead to statutory protections for survivors of sexual harm, that they not be punished for reporting incidents, why they might have been behaving in some illegal behavior? So, I mean, we certainly want to protect our, the student who would make a complaint. Our problem is that Title IX, from the federal perspective, is, is really a very, um, it, it's a significant 
legislation. It, it is very detailed. So what we don't want to have is a situation where, however well intentioned, we then run up into a, a place where our our state legislation um, creates some type of friction with our obligation under the federal law. But certainly the if this council wants to you know can look at language that provides protections they would have to be aware of the fact that title nine um, has some very specific requirements for us okay i think in the report they listed like six or ten other states that did it so i guess well if they figured it out we could figure it out but i'll i'll investigate that further Uh, we're going to return to this uh, tomorrow afternoon, and I'm hoping that senators will have an opportunity to consult with uh, Ms. Childs about possible language changes that you all might be interested in uh, as we move forward. I'm, I'm hoping to get back to uh, Senate Judiciary by Friday with uh, a little bit more specificity around you know what direction we might be heading in. Um, Additional questions for uh, Ms. Turley or uh, Ms. Lavasser. Okay. Can I ask, uh, let me ask yes, a quick please. question. Yeah. Have you have any um, students who, ha who have been identified as causing sexual violence to other students? Uh, how are they sort of, how are they adjudicated and punished? Do they get do they get thrown off of sports teams? Do they get, uh, I mean, do they get taken out of classes? What ha uh, just trying to sort out what it is that has happened recently. I mean, I, I know a lot about, I know do know a lot about this, but I'm just wondering what is the current activity that's going on? Sure. Well, so if a student has been has um, violated Title IX, which those the, what you're saying would be a violation of Title IX, um, there's first the investigatory process, and then there's an, a, a, and there's a, a finding of responsibility, and then uh, discipline and consequences come. Um, those the discipline and consequences will range um, depending on the on the severity of the conduct. Uh, but that is my understanding is that a student, uh, we are, so we're in a pretty new title, the title nine was updated a year ago. So we aren't, I don't know that we've had an adjudication that's gone to that stage um, under the new title nine uh, regulations. So, but, but it is my understanding that those are the, the types of disciplines and consequences that are available. At what stage uh, is law enforcement engaged? So law enforcement is engaged um, if the complainant wants law enforcement engaged. Uh, we, we, um, we have to report crimes um, under the Clary Act, which uh, is not just about sexual violence. Um, it, it involves other crimes as well. Uh, but um, really that, I believe that that tends to be up to the complainant if they want the police involved. It, it may well be that, uh, well, I, I, I believe that that would be the, the, the typical way. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Okay, thank you both for being with us. Uh, as I mentioned, we will return to this conversation tomorrow mm -hmm. afternoon uh, I am going to tell uh, Senate Judiciary, unless I see uh, senators uh, saying no, that we, we are going to, as soon as we're going to suggest that we return this language to the bill with changes. Uh, I don't see anybody who is, is opposing this at this point. So um, they can anticipate that over the next couple of days, we will work on edits and again, uh, return this um, to uh, the Senate version. Uh, yes, uh, Ms. Childs. I just wanted to mention that um, if there are certain things that you know that you might like to see language on for tomorrow, if I could draft those in anticipation of that, because I'm I'm booked all afternoon in other committees on markup, so I, I'm sure I can pop in and, and whatever, but I I, um, I just don't know. Uh, Absolutely. 
So what I'm going to ask senators to do is to reach out to you individually uh, because okay. I think different people are having different thoughts at this point. And so, uh, and have senators uh, bring those, bring that language with them tomorrow afternoon. So everybody have different amendments or? Well, I don't think you're going to hear from everybody, but I think there are a couple of people that are just thinking about some suggested language changes. I, I don't know if we're in the stage where they even need to be drafted, per, you know, but I would like people to come back with their ideas at the very least tomorrow and perhaps having run them by you in some way, just to make sure that, that they would work. Sure. Okay. Okay. Yeah, great. Uh, the other final request uh, committee is that you review the amendment that we are going to uh, uh, present tomorrow on the floor uh, to the school construction bill. And uh, if I, I don't think there's a need for us to gather at nine tomorrow. Uh, but if everyone would please get back to me by uh, between at, by nine tomorrow, uh, if you are supportive of that amendment, and that is in your inboxes now, Senator Chinden. That is the radon amendment, correct? That, yes, yes. Thank you. That is the radon amendment. Have a look. It's very brief, uh, and uh, just uh, let me know. It looks good. Okay. Okay, uh, tomorrow we do have, we're returning to this, we're returning to 106, which needs to be voted out on Friday, and we're, we're also jumping back in uh, to uh, some church and state language, uh, returning to some church and state language that we started working on earlier this session. Uh, so that's where we are at. So uh, thanks for a productive uh, afternoon. And uh, Senator Terenzini, did you? No, okay. Senator Purcell, if you don't mind sticking around for just one moment um, so we can talk about the floor tomorrow. Thanks, everybody.